at the Ryder Cup, uh, Whistling Straits. So that was a, we had a very cool opportunity there. Steve Stricker um, and his wife reached out because one of the players had showed him some of our head covers and he goes, I want these as a captain's gift for the players. And so I get a call like three weeks before the Ryder Cup and um, hey, Nick, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, Nikki Stricker and Steve Stricker here. You know, can we talk to you for a second? We need you to make some Ryder Cup head covers. We, we, we've seen your stuff. You guys are so creative. Could you make something cool as Steve's captain's gift? When's the Ryder Cup? You know, three weeks. <laughs> uh, sure. What do you want? Oh, we want something custom for every player. Okay. <laughs> for um, each one. For each one. So I said, all right, you got to give me a couple of days. I'll figure it out. I call Justin on the phone and I go, hey, we're going to do this thing. Like, <laughs> like it or not, we got we to gotta make this happen. I'm Roberto. And I'm Dan. On the Course Record Show, we talk about the business of golf. We discuss the trends, insights, and strategies defining the industry, now and into the future. Welcome to episode 36 of the Course Record Show. We are joined by Nick Benson. Your listeners have been stuck with a few of uh, Dan and Roberto episodes, but we're back with a guest in a big way. Nick is the founder of Swag Golf, and uh, really thrilled to have you on, Nick. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So Nick, uh, you know, sometimes we get some pushback from listeners about too many acronyms or they may take a while to catch up. Let's just start. What is Swag Golf? Swag Golf is a, uh, a bold brand that uh, started seven years ago. Uh, we make extremely high stitch count head covers, badass putters, uh, really no, uh, you know, no, no stone is unturned when we're making our products. We try to make everything we can here in the United States. Uh, we try to be bold and different, and uh, we always want to bring something to the customers that they're not expecting. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm going to start with a quote. I'm going to read you a quote of your own. You said, I worked alongside some of the most important people in the golf industry, and that taught me a lot of what to do and, more importantly, what not to do. So what did you set out not to do with Swag Golf? Well, you know what? I was uh, very fortunate to be able to uh, spend a lot of years working for some of the best putter makers in the world. And, you know, one of the things that uh, from an early age, I always thought was that golf was kind of boring. Um, not so much the game itself, but just the products that were out there. And specifically in the last, you know, 15 years, I feel that the golf industry has really needed to have a little bolder, a little younger vibe. And a lot of what I saw happening was trying to cater to, um, you know, maybe golfers of of old and not golfers of new and um you know that that age demographic has changed dramatically uh i think the younger uh generations are playing more golf and they're looking for something different to put in their golf bags and i'm just matching timelines here you started swag seven years ago before the covid golf boom which you know do you think that covid kind of accelerated that trend of younger growth in on the younger side of the game or do you think it brought it in um and you saw it before kind of before the market did. Yeah. I mean, COVID obviously changed uh, the golf landscape dramatically, but um, you know, luckily for us, uh, when I started the business, I had a, a, a hunch that this was going to go very well and that there was going to be a, a group of people that really wanted the product. And we scaled assuming it was going to happen and got ready for, you know, what we thought was going to be one of our biggest years, which happened to be the first year of COVID. Wow. And uh, because of that kind of planning ahead, we were actually able to execute uh, pretty flawlessly during COVID when other companies weren't able to do so. So um, obviously COVID helped, but we were, we were ready to, to grow the business uh, on its own without COVID. So in, in describing swag, you use the word bold twice. And you already mentioned going for a younger customer. But how do you differentiate? Like, tell us more about the specific choices you make in terms of whether it's creative or product and launched timeline. Tell us more about that. What goes into being bold to a younger customer? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, kind of going back to what did you set out not to do with swag golf? Uh, a lot of the ideas that you see at swag, uh, specifically the things that really we launched with when we first started the business were either ideas that, um, other people had said, Hey, that's not a good idea. It doesn't fit golf. It doesn't, you know, it's not, it doesn't fit our demographic or it doesn't fit our customer base. And, um, you know, those ideas were the things that I kind of just put in my back pocket because I felt that, Hey, these are actually great ideas. These are things that, uh, at the time, I was thinking I was going after like a 20 to 35 year old age group. And it turns out that what we were doing was really going after almost all age groups. Um, a lot of nostalgia plays, a lot of uh, kind of pop culture, pop culture references, and just doing things that, um, 
you know, I think other branches weren't willing to do, whether it was, you know, the neon colors or, you know, just the extent of stitching 175,000 stitches on a head cover. Uh, nobody wants to do that. It takes so long, but that's the only way to make the product that I wanted to make. So what turned those bad ideas into good ideas? Did you take like an insights based process to figure out whether or not they actually work? Did you just, just try a bunch of stuff and see what worked? How did you, how did you uncover that? Uh, I mean, honestly, my, my kind of job history has always been knowing what people are going to like. Uh, and I thought all these ideas people were going to like, and it just happens that um, other people who were uh, further up the, 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 the totem pole than I were didn't like them. And um, I said, you know, hey, I think this is still a great idea. I'm not sure why nobody else thinks it's a good idea. And it's something that I want to execute one day. So I had this idea for swag for years, and it was something that uh, I kind of just kept in my back pocket. It was, you know, it, it was a, a stretch goal, maybe, you know, to, hey, one day, this is something I could, I could actually execute. And when the opportunity came to do it myself, I just took that little black book of ideas and started running. So when you say the people that push back or the customers that weren't interested, I mean, was that internal? Were you at a, another brand and you were trying to say, hey, this could be a line for us or this could be you know, a push? Or was it like, were you going wholesale and trying to sell to like big box? Like who were the no's coming from? Because the yeses, I mean, I think, you know, you kind of went straight to the consumer and the yeses came from the consumer. Who did the, who did the no's come from? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess that's my, that, that was really the genesis of the brand, right? Is that I felt that the golf industry in general didn't want this product in, in the golf space. Um, and yes, who I was working for in the past also, you know, I wouldn't say they said it was a bad idea. It's just that it didn't fit their brands. Yeah. And, um, you know, I find that funny though, because now I feel like a lot of people are copying what we're doing after I started doing this. So, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, it's flattering, but it's funny because, uh, I, like I said, I thought the golf industry needed this type of brand and, uh, clearly I was right, but, um, you know, it's just interesting that at the time it didn't fit the, the golf landscape. That's one thing about, you know, brand and fashion or culture is having great taste, which you obviously have, like, you know, you flat out said it, like I have a taste that I think people connect to. If you have success with it, you're going to get copied. That's just part of the industry. So I'm sure you're seeing some of that now. Yeah. I mean, you know, swag was really kind of on the forefront of, I guess the, you know, the change in golf. Um, there was no, like the mall bonds, the East sides, the, the other, the other brands that are out there now, which I think golf desperately needed. And I'm, I think it's awesome that they exist. We really were kind of like very early to this idea yeah. of making something for the new generation of golfer. So you launched your brand on April fool's day. Um, I, I work for a company that's owned by Markel, which is a huge kind of insurance conglomerate. And I think part of their mission statement, like they have a one line mission statement and it's to like serve investors by making quality investments with always uh, maintaining a sense of humor or maintaining like a comedic, you, you know, humility. It sounds like you have that you started, you know, you launched your brand on April fool's day. Was it intentional or just uh, a coincidence? Uh, so, you know, the long story short of it is, is that, you know, we kind of had this idea, um, don't be a fool, join us on, on April one at, or at really it's at midnight of April one, uh, as we launched swag golf. And it was very vague that first, you know, eight months that we were in business, we teased our product at the PGA show. Um, we had a single pillar with one putter and one head cover in it with, uh, two models standing next to it. When people asked questions, they just said, we don't know anything about the brand. And I, I purposely did it that way. It was, no it was way. Hey, be, let's, let's intrigue people. Um, you know, well, what's the story? We don't know the story. Uh, check out the website on, on April one at midnight and, um, you know, knock on wood, uh, it, it, it worked out extremely well for us. We had a ton of people on the website. I think that as the word got out there that, uh, Nick Venson was behind this brand and a few people kind of found out that it made it uh, a little more, a um, little easier for people to, to, you know, tune in and, and take a chance at this new brand. We teased a few things on Instagram, but we used social media to our advantage and just tried to uh, get people excited about something that was new and different. That is really cool. I did not know that story. So you mentioned your name got some excitement from the community and you mentioned some of your background before being good at picking what customers like and don't like. Tell us more about your background and what kind of, what, what you're doing before Swag Golf. So, uh, you know, I started, I guess I could say I really started in the golf industry at like 14 years old. I was parking carts at the, uh, the local golf course, um, waking up at, you know, four 30 in the morning, getting dropped off by my parents and parking carts. And, uh, for whatever reason I was attracted to, uh, to putters at an early age, I was a good putter I was a good short game guy. And for some reason, um, you know, a Scotty Cameron putter was like 
the uh, it was the thing for me. Like I, I needed to have one. And this is 1996 when I was, you know, kind of coveting my my first Scotty Cameron. Um, and at the time, uh, the head pro at the local golf course didn't want to spend what they were spending on Scotty Camerons, um, which I think if I remember was like 173 bucks or 72 bucks, something like that. Wow. And um, I basically convinced my dad to, uh, you know, let me borrow some money. I'd pay him back, um, you know, to, to, to be able to buy this putter. And, uh, I bought my first Scotty Cameron. It was a Terillium Scotty Cameron oh, yeah. and, um, I fell in love with it. And my friends always came to me to kind of be like the guy of what's cool and what's new, whether it was, I don't know if you guys remember like the UST Mamiya purple and yellow pro Four Sixty Five shaft at VJ. Oh, yeah. was like, I was like the first guy to have that in our group. Um, you know, uh, just, just kind of like some of those odd, you know, the things that nowadays wouldn't seem odd, but like back then those were pretty wild to have. Um, they were just different from, you know, your normal Graffaloi red uh, shaft or your EI 70 green, you know, in your, in your Titleist driver. And um, uh, I just, I, f- I fell in love with putters and I actually made a business out of buying and selling Scotty Cameron putters to Japan. Um, I was on the golf web classifieds pre eBay, pre, you know, Facebook groups. And, uh, I was selling new Scotty Camerons to guys in Japan and buying old Scotty Camerons and selling them to collectors in the U S this is all around the age of 14, 15. And I basically wow. built a business out of it. That was much better than working at the golf course. <laughs> you didn't start swag with putters. Did you, you started with head covers. I understand. Is that, can you tell, can you walk us through that decision? Um, so actually, believe it or not, I really did start with putters. Um, oh. that was, that was the concept behind it. I really wanted to make a putter. Uh, what I consider the right way and kind of going back again to the, what did you set out not to do? Um, I had asked a million times why you can't mill a putter start to finish um, without any hand polishing. Um, that's a, that was like a big, just, it was a pet peeve of mine because you can be the best polisher in the world and you'll never polish two putters the same way. I saw it happen with tour players. Uh, I've seen it happen with wedges. I've seen it happen on putters, uh, you know, basically anything. And these guys are extremely talented, but we're talking, you know, half a gram here, tenth of a gram, whatever it is, and the way the toe is rounded or the top line or something, just very, you know, minute details, but the pros want something that's very um, exact every single time. They want it repetitive. And so I had this idea that, hey, I think you can mill a putter start to finish. And I was always told it's too expensive. It's not worth the time. Nobody else really cares about it. And so when I started Swag, my first goal was to make a putter start to finish without any hand polishing. Um, and it took us nine months to make the first putter. That's why when we launched, we only had one putter. Uh, we only had 50 of them, I think. And um, the covers were not necessarily a byproduct, but it was just other things that I like to make. And a lot of those early designs were, um, again, some ideas that I already had, ideas that I wanted to share with the world and just things that I thought were cool. Um, turns out that people love the head covers um, as much as the putters, if not more, and um, head covers took off. So uh, I'm not, I'm not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, covers are great and I love selling covers. So we sell covers and putters. Very cool. cool. So tell me though, milling a putter, I mean, kind of one oh one. you starting with a block of metal and you're putting it in a, a computer milling, a CNC machine and out comes a finished putter head. Is that, was that the goal? And what, what is the difference with something that has to be hand polished? It only gets 90% of the way there. Like what, what is the main difference there? Yeah. So just like to kind of put it into like, even just like a uh, minutes on a machine. Um, I would say a, a, a pretty standard industry putter is probably machined for around 40 to 45 minutes um, okay. where a lot of ours are close to an hour and a half. And this is not including the engraving. This is just machining the head itself out of a block of steel. Um, and when you do that way, again, we're not polishing. So when, when our heads come off, you literally can hold in your hand. It feels like it's polished but it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's done in a machine and it's repetitive so that every single putter is identical, whether it's the bend of the neck or, you know, uh, the offset, the weight, whatever it is, we want things to be, you know, basically exactly the same as the one prior to it every single time. When you go to polishing, um, you might, you know, you might do 60% of the work, you might do 70% of the work. Um, and then the rest is done by hand to kind oh, of wow. give the contours and the edges and the softness, um, that people expect out of a putter. And those things um, are what causes some of that, you know, inconsistencies from one head to another. I have a putter I used. Um, I got it when I was like 16. It was a circle T and it was, I used it for like six years all through college. And then I would always go back to it later in my career. And I can't tell you what it is, but something about the corners and the edges and the way it sits 
are just different than all the rest of them that I have. And um, your, your hand finishing explains some of that and maybe some, you know, psycho golfer stuff in my head too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would be honest with you. I think that we're, we're making putters for, you know, for everybody, but I think those that are kind of into putters and understand what we're doing, they're the ones that like really look at the product and they, when they buy 10 of them, they put them on their wall and they're all literally identical. Um, it's really, it's, you know, that's, it means something to them. Um, it may not mean something to the, the one-time buyer, but the guys who are really into this stuff um, really appreciate the fact that there's a, a consistency and, and, so do the, and so do the pros. I mean, that's, that's really the, the genesis of it is that, hey, I, I want to have more putters in the hands of PGA Tour players. So the best way of doing that is if I make them something and then a year goes by and they want a tweak on it, it's all programmed the first time around where I can make that tweak. It doesn't change the rest of the head. There's no polishing. It's, it's, a, it's an exact replica of what they had before with the tweak they wanted. I love that. I was the same way with wedges. The, um, the company I use now, I felt like they were just consistently came off the line and you're changing them right. Every three months, every six weeks, sometimes with a 60 putter, you might keep for years, but I just wanted something that was the same. The hand finishing is always fun, but then it's like, you're starting over three months later or six months later. Um, that's really cool. All right, Nick question. So gear people, uh, gear guys or gear girls they're they're usually just not into one thing right if you're really into putters my guess is you're into cars or you're into watches or you're into furniture or coffee makers or all right so what else are you into and your customers what else are they into yeah, yeah um so my, my my personal list is is long i'm into a lot of stuff uh i'm into trading cards i'm into watches i love watches i'm uh I'm into uh, mid-century modern furniture, yeah, uh, into vintage pinball. Um, oh, wow. I, I collect some, some odd stuff. Um, and the list is a lot longer than that, but those are the ones that uh, I spend the most time on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's one of those things where I, I have to scratch my itch because uh, my itch used to be collecting, you know, high-end Scotty Camerons back in the day and, and putters. And now it's like, well, uh, I make my own stuff so I can get out anything I want. I got to find something else to, to chase, but I've always been into watches and pinball. Those are like two things that I'm really into. That's cool. Do you have a, like a warehouse or in your, you have a place where you can keep all that? Yeah. Um, you know, to my wife's chagrin, I have quite a few pinball machines at home. Um, but I got two boys that love to play them. And, uh, in the shop we have uh, like a whole arcade set up. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. And if, you know, I, I encourage every listener to, you know, check out immediately, um, y'all's website and, and the stock that's out there, you'll just understand the inspiration, uh, a lot of that coming from different cultural touch points, including pinball, you can see it immediately. So that's awesome. Yeah. You know, you, you asked about the collectors too. And I think it's really kind of important to bring up that when I started swag, I thought I was, like I said, I was kind of thought I was going after this 20 to 35 year old age group. Yeah. And, um, uh, we actually did, um, a couple surveys to our customers. Cause you're we curious, like, you know, where they were coming from, what else they collected. So, same question you asked. One thing that we found really interesting is that there was a ton of people that said they had never collected anything golf before until oh. they until they bought a swag head cover. Uh, that it kind of spoke to them. It was different than everything else that they that they had bought, and um, it's kind of interesting because I think that that is part of the reason I did it is that I was creating something for someone who didn't find anything interesting in the golf space, and now we have people collecting swag head covers and putters that don't even golf. Um, they put it as like art in their house or in their offices, which is. Uh, a pretty cool feeling when you know someone's buying just because they think it's cool. Well, many are collecting. Some are selling in the secondary market. How do you how do you feel when you see one of your products go on the secondary market for for quite a big markup? You know, it's uh, it's sometimes it's a little disheartening because I'm like, man, it's unbelievable that somebody was able to sell it for that much. At the same time, I'm excited because I know that the person who bought it um, feels really good, good about selling it, and they're probably gonna come back and spend some more money with us. So. Um, you know, we're not trying to capture the secondary market, really. It's something that uh, I feel is like a necessary evil if you're making limited products. Um, you know, not every single product we make is, is going to, you know, skyrocket in price. But I do feel that if we're making cool products and we're keeping the, the batches relatively small, that there's, um, you know, that's, that creates the collectability, creates part of the community, creates, um, you know, what we're trying to build as a brand. Because uh, I did want to make something that made you feel good. I always told people, you know, when I started the business, like, well, what? what's this drop model that swag has? And I go, well, to me, it's like no different than being a kid in you know grade school. If you're the first kid that got Nintendo at Christmas or the you know first kid that got a pair of Air Jordans on the, on the school bus, like you kind of get that cool vibe. Like, oh my God, like look at, look at Nick's shoes or look at the, you know, Nick got a Nintendo, whatever it is. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, subconsciously every single golfer wants to walk up to a tee box and have a caddy or someone in their foursome or someone at the range, look at their bag and go like, 
what the hell is that? That thing's awesome. How'd you get that? I've never seen that before and it makes you feel good. So that's, that's, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the game with, with making these products is making them in a quantity that's, you know, the right amount that it's cool. If you make too many, it's not cool anymore. Did you study any, you know, kind of, I mean, this is not, you didn't invent the concept, right? I mean, Hermes to Louis Vuitton to Supreme, you know, have, have employed this. Have, did you read any case studies or kind of keep checking in on these certain brands and see what they did well or see what they didn't, or you just followed your instinct? No, just really followed my instinct. I mean, again, you know, being a, being a consumer of things and uh, being into a lot of things myself, it's yeah. really no different than, you know, Jordan shoes or watches yeah. or, you know, old pinball. Like there's just a limited quantity of them out there. And, you know, if you, if you don't make more of them, um, they tend to go up in value. Let's talk about channel strategy. I mean, we, we chose to go DTC, direct to consumer. And unlike some of those luxury houses, right, they, they try to create a very specific channel strategy, but I'm thinking in your category, more akin to like the underground sneaker shop or the really cool vintage hat shop or trading card place. But are, any plans of, of opening a retail outlet anytime soon or is DTC the way to go in your mind? You know, uh, I started DTC because honestly, at the time, I just felt that that was really the only way to get the product out there because we had constraints on how much we could make. Um, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy to make the quantities that uh, I wanted to early on. So, you know, why wholesale? Let's just go direct to consumer. And obviously then COVID hit and direct to consumer was kind of the only way to go. Uh, and the business, um, you know, blossomed from there. Uh, we're actually going to be in a new shop in about five months, um, huge 30,000 square foot facility here in Northbrook, Illinois. And uh, we're going to have a full putting studio and, and um, you know, shopping experience for people that want to come in. We, we had some other conversations with DTC founders and CEOs for the listener that's episodes 15, 16, and 17. And some of the themes that jumped out there, I want to sort of validate, see if they ring true with your experience. They said the DTC was key for them because of the advertising economics now with digital marketing being huge and just the, well, at least in a pre-COVID context, how much easier the supply chain had gotten from like accessibility to things that having to be able to produce and not mass quantities and still be able to do it at a pretty affordable price. Does that ring true for you at all? Were there other reasons behind a decision? Yeah. I mean, honestly, early on, the cost of making the putters was going to be so high as we were prototyping and starting the whole thing that there really wasn't even an option to wholesale the product. Like I just didn't have the margin to do it. So yeah. direct consumer was really the only way to sell that product. Um, you know, and early on the first years, we weren't manufacturing our own head covers. Um, so again, um, I was kind of a middleman at that point. We were sending designs over, having them manufactured, and then we were selling them. So um, again, it kind of, it kind of all fell into the same bucket of there wasn't the margin there to do it um, any other way. And I also think that just the direct consumer experience can typically be better than, you know, buying it through a, a third party somewhere, because if there's a problem, like we're just going to deal with it, we're going to handle it. I want to, you know, I don't want to say we're like uh, Nordstrom's, but like the, the goal is that, you know, if there's, if there's a problem, we want to fix it. We don't, we don't want to let the customer linger with a product that they're not happy with. I see. All right. Let's talk a little bit about manufacturing. So I read somewhere that, uh, you, one of your first hires, if not your first hire was an industrial engineer. So the co-host of this esteemed podcast, Dan and myself are both uh, industrial engineers. So where do you make the product? Well, you know, what is the, what is that physical process of getting a putter or a head cover out the door uh, look like and, and what, why that first key hire? Well, let me start off by saying I am not an industrial engineer <laughs> and nor do I pretend to be one, but um, I dabble in a lot of things. So I was fortunate enough that growing up, I, um, I was able to take AutoCAD and, and SolidWorks and do things that, you know, a lot of kids my age probably didn't have the ability to do in high school and in college. And, um, you know, I, I knew my limits though, and I needed somebody who would be, be able to design a putter start to finish, um, and actually send it over to CNC and be able to do this, um, in, in the right way. So, Long story short, I hired one of my best friends. Um, he was an uh, industrial engineer. Um, he had never designed a putter before, but it was one of those things where I said, hey, like, I think that with my guidance, we can, we can make this putter the way I want to make it and actually machine this thing the way I want to machine it. And, um, you know, it was one of those, I guess it was a passion project. That's why it took us nine months to, to make the first putter. So we machine all the putters here in Chicago. Um, all the head covers are made in Atlanta. And, um, you know, we still kind of follow the same process we followed on day one. The only difference is we've bought more CNC machines and, and bought more embroidery machines and we just keep going. You mentioned the Atlanta piece. Um, 
so Justin Eckert is a friend of mine. He, he had a head cover business, EP head covers. Um, you guys merged, you acquired them. Like, I mean, tell us about how you met, how that relationship, you know, how'd you build some trust and, and say that, Hey, maybe this is a, a one plus one equals three situation. So I met Justin, uh, probably three years, four years before I started swag. Oh, wow. And, um, honestly, uh, being some somewhat someone who was into the golf collectible space, I, I knew that he had a good product on day one, but it needed some tweaks and needed some, um, need some massaging. And, you know, he was just getting going. And, uh, you know, I think he was still in his garage maybe when I first, when I first talked to him, um, then they were in their first shop, but, uh, I knew right away that I wanted to use him for, uh, our head covers when we started swag. And, uh, it was one of those things where I just knew that the product was amazing. The embroidery was amazing. And, the biggest issue was getting enough of them. Um, that was really the pro that was the problem that I had to solve for because he didn't have the, um, didn't have the staff to be able to pull it off. And I saw swags growth curve and I said, Hey man, Justin, we gotta, we gotta figure something out. And, um, you know, long story short, after like probably a year of negotiations, um, we decided to acquire EP and, um, it was an, an, an awesome move for both of us. Um, EP's business has grown dramatically since then. They still do their own uh, green grass uh, work as well. But um, for swag, it was, you know, it was really paramount. If we didn't, if we didn't do it, we never would have been able to make the head covers that we made. Yeah. Just, and Justin's story is great, by the way, Dan. Next time you're down, he's asked me to come check out the manufacturing facility for years. And I have not driven 30 minutes up the road to do it. And I've heard it's just fascinating, but Justin, I mean, true started this like at 21 years old, like last year of college or first year out and just your classic, like had no idea what I was doing, learned, you know, by taking the bumps and bruises and has built a really nice business. He's a wonderful guy. So I'm not yeah. surprised you two get along, Nick. That's, that's a great story. No, I mean, it's it, honestly, like I said, it, it, I'm glad that it worked out the way he did. So, so Justin in the end actually ended up becoming a, a part owner in swag. That's how we, that's how we structured the deal, which actually made it better for both of us. And the, the money we would have spent to, uh, to grow, e, you know, or to, to buy EP, to acquire EP, we ended up dumping into EP. So now there's, uh, I think there's 120 employees down in Georgia making head covers every day, uh, which is uh, a, a pretty far cry from where he was uh, three or four years ago. Yeah, that's great. And smart deal making. You know, yeah. it's the business We're of golf podcast. That's the kind of stuff we like to get into there. Yeah. That's right. No, it worked out great. Yeah. We want us to see the term sheet, but that's good. Info. Yeah. <laughs> so you're super involved with the product, right? It's a big passion of yours. You've tinkered with it. You've machined it. You've spent nine months making your putter, all that kind of stuff. You're really into it. As you scale, including with the EP acquisition, where do you, how do you find a line between staying super involved and knowing how to let go and let others take, how do you find your own lane, so to speak, right? Are you like Mark Cuban all in all the time or do you take sort of a different tack? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, the truth is, is that um, I'm trying to let go of the things that I don't enjoy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, for a while, uh, so now there's 40 people here in Chicago at Swag. Uh, for a while, um, I was uh, CMO, CFO, CEO. Um, I was HR. Uh, I was kind of everything, you know, and that's back when we had like 12 to 15 people. Um, and then fortunately I was able to bring on some really good people to take over some of the stuff that I just don't want to deal with. Um, so I have an awesome COO and an awesome CFO now. And, uh, we also have a chief creative as well that has taken a lot of that off my plate, but I am still very heavily involved in the day-to-day -day from like the marketing and design aspect of it. That's what I enjoy most. That's what, that's what, you know, that's what I enjoy about the business. Um, and I think that, you know, that's what I should be focusing on because, uh, you know, even though I'm, I'm CEO, uh, I feel like I bring the most to the table when it comes to those ideas. Still, it's, you know, I'm, I'm still the idea guy, idea guy on, you know, 80% of what we do, I bet. So what does the team around you look like now? Like you mentioned 40 people in Chicago, but what are the, what are some of the key functions that you lean on people the most? We got, uh, you know, we got eight amazing designers here that, um, you know, are cranking out designs every day, uh, whether it's bags, head covers, putters. Um, it's, you know, a huge part of what we do. Um, you know, we have a, a marketing department and a sales team that's phenomenal. And sales is a, is a funny one for us because we, you know, we've always been direct to consumer. Um, and last year we started doing some stuff for Greengrass and Country Club and Corporate. And that's been um, an awesome addition to the business. We also are in licensing now because we have NFL, MLB, uh, WWE, uh, working on some 
um, some other ones as well. And all those just take up time. So we have a you know a fully dedicated sales team to make sure that we're hitting all those things for all these companies we're working with, or you know just stuff that we want to sell ourselves. Um, you know, I think that uh, the, the back of the house is huge for us. So we still we still QC every head cover by hand. Um, every putter is painted by hand, and, you know, and 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 finished by hand. So. Um, as far as, you know, like just making sure it looks clean and, and, and there's no, you know, smudges on it or anything like that. So those are, um, you know, we got a full team dedicated to that every day, just making sure everything comes out looking perfect. All right. Let's talk about, I mean, like this has been seven years, like you said, it took time to get even to that day one, any stop the clock moments or, or big breaks or just, you know, rooms you find yourself in or conversations you're in that you're just like, my gosh, how did we get here? Right. Any of those jump out? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's been like pretty much three moments in time that if they didn't happen, I'm not sure we'd be here where we are today. Yep. Um, obviously the, the acquisition of EP was huge for us. Um, I mean, at the time swag was still like a nothing blip on the radar. I mean, people knew who we were, but a very small amount of them. And um, I think that for us, we knew that if we wanted this thing to, to be what it was, we needed to own our manufacturing in the head cover space. And um, thankfully that worked out the way it did because it allowed us to basically take at the time, you know, EP was making covers for a lot of brands, not just swag. And it was able to, you know, put our stamp on and say, Hey, this is going to be our brand. This is what we're going to make for ourselves. And we're not going to make it for other people anymore. Um, which allowed us to make what I consider the, the best head cover in the market um, for, for swag and swag alone. Uh, that was, that was really, you know, a very pivotal point. Uh, one of the other things that I think happened was, uh, the Ryder Cup. Uh, so it was the 2000, uh, what, 20, was it 21? I'm, I'm, I'm confused because of COVID. Yeah, right? the, the right. 2020 Ryder Cup was played in 21. 21. Yeah. So, so what, um, Whistling Straits, is that right? Yeah, at Whistling Straits. So that was a, we had a very cool opportunity there. So uh, at the time we were working with, you know, a couple of PGA Tour players and a lot of these guys, some of these guys were using our head covers, but there was a few guys dabbling in putters and I won't say their names because you know, I don't have a name and likeness for them, but they were using the product. And uh, Steve Stricker um, and his wife reached out because one of the players had showed him some of our head covers and he goes, I want these as a captain's gift for the players. And so I get a call like three weeks before the Ryder Cup and um, hey, Nick, you know, it's 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 uh, Nicky Stricker and Steve Stricker here. You know, can we talk to you for a second? Sure. You know, I don't, I don't know what they want. Um, we need you to make some Ryder Cup head covers. We, we, we've seen your stuff. You guys are so creative. Could you make something cool as Steve's captain's gift? when's the Ryder cup, you know, three weeks. Huh. Uh, sure. What do you want? Oh, we want something custom for every player. Okay. For um, each one. For each one. And no, I, no idea from them. like what they wanted, just, they want something cool. So I said, all right, you got to give me a couple of days. I'll figure it out. I called Justin on the phone and I go, Hey, we're going to do this thing. Like, like it or not, we gotta, we gotta make this happen. It's too cool of an opportunity. And, you know, Steve goes, I, you know, I don't know if they're going to use them, but like, it's just a, it's something I want to do as a gift and I'm sure you guys will come with something creative. So we came with a couple ideas and um, at the time we had like released, you know, a couple of these dollar bill head covers um, over the course of, you know, the years prior. And our thing is like putting sunglasses on everything. So if you, if you guys look at all of our covers, 99% of them, the characters wearing sunglasses and, you know, so Franklin on the hundred dollar bill with sunglasses and uh, Lincoln with sunglasses on the $5 bill. So I had this idea of that. I think it'd be cool to make matching Ryder cup covers you know, red, white, and blue matching the bags with the, you know, the characters, uh, with, with the hundred dollar bill, the $5 bill, the $20 bill, and, um, put like Steve as the treasurer and have the player as the, uh, you know, um, I can't remember what's the other thing that's on there, but the, uh, the other signature that's on there. And, um, so I had to basically rip all their signatures offline, try to find them, uh, so I could put, you know, custom for each player. And then the date on the bills got changed to the Ryder cup date and the serial numbers represented something about the, the Ryder cup that year. And I showed it to Steve and he goes, man, this is awesome. I go, yeah. And I got this other idea. I'm going to put it in this walnut wood box with shredded currency from the treasury and have all their head covers in it with like this big plastic and uh, big plastic clear top on it. that says the Ryder cup, you know, team and it's gift from Steve Stricker. And you can put your note in there. And this is again, during COVID, right? So um, I go, I'll have them done, you know, the week before or the week of, I'll have to figure out how to get them to you. And at this time, I, again, I have no idea if these players are going to put them in play or not, but, um, he goes, Hey, you got to drive them up. I'm we're in Chicago. I had to drive them up to whistling straights. We get up there the, the Tuesday of the Ryder cup 
and they won't let us in because there's a, a COVID bubble. So, oh. you know, I hope, I hope Steve doesn't get in trouble. I don't think he will. It's, it's, it's too late at this point. He has to like meet me at like this strip mall, like a mile away from where they're staying. And, and, and we have to transfer it from you know, our car to his car so they can, he can get the, get the boxes for the players. And, you know, he goes, I'm going to give them to him at the players dinner. You know, hopefully they like them. Maybe someone will t- post a picture of them, you know, whatever it is. So we do it. Um, I hear nothing the night of the players dinner, like not a word. Um, didn't hear anything from, from, from Steve or Nikki, except that, Hey, the players got them and they felt they were cool. And I was like, okay, great. They, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, we're watching on TV the next morning. Uh, and all of a sudden, like every player is walking out with all the head covers on their bag. And it just became this, this huge thing because, um, it was just a great moment for swag. It was, it was like our, everybody in the world was watching and we had our covers on the bags and everybody knew they were our covers. Our customers knew they were our covers and it just became a, um, kind of like a, like, you know, again, we, we can put a stamp on it as like, that was a, a big turning point for the brand. So, so you had three weeks, you said, right. So if it wasn't the strickers calling and it wasn't the Ryder cup, like what, what would an ordinary lead time look like for that kind of order? Well, at this point, actually very fortunately, we can, we can turn stuff like almost overnight. Um, you know, we, we have, we have enough people working in, in Georgia that if, you know, if push came to shove and, and the right opportunity came along, um, we can, we can knock things out in 48 hours probably um, and, and get finished product in quantity to somebody. But uh, honestly, the goal is always to try to do things, you know, 10 to 12 weeks out so that we have, uh, you know, ample time to get materials or embossing or whatever else that we got to do to make sure that the product looks right. Well, I'm going to put in a word to my pro for the next tea gift for our events. Make awesome. it swag. Love it. Happy to do it. I just got my first swag putter. I played in a fried egg event and uh, I got uh, a really cool one from the rock hammer. It's, it's very oh, cool. Yeah. 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 Andy's awesome. We, uh, so, you know, small world. I don't know if you know, Andy and I went to high school together. No way. Yeah. So um, yeah, I've known Andy for a long time. We played, we played in the golf team together in, in, uh, in high school. That is hysterical. Wow. I mean, what are the chances that two like really prominent kind of new golf brands um, come out? I mean, you're, you know, brick and mortar and building physical things and he's just built a great media brand. So that's awesome. Great story. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a small world. Actually, even, I mean, a little plug for a couple of buddies, but I actually have four guys from high school in my close circle that all ended up in the golf business. Uh, really? A guy named Henry Rowland who makes Chaplin bags. Oh, okay. um, oh yeah. And also from our same golf team growing up and um, uh, Nick Schreiber started old barn wall. Oh yeah. Um, all of us were the same group of kids in high school that loved golf and all ended up in the golf business, which is kind of crazy. All right. Uh, look ahead. Where does swag go from here? Uh, I'll tease a couple of things. I saw you have like a wedge on your website and then also you have an event series, which I'm curious about. So, um, you know, op- open question, but where, where do we go? What's the future look like for swag? Yeah. You know, last year we started this, uh, this swag series. Um, the idea behind it was to get collectors and, you know, new new buyers potentially to, you know, meet and mingle, um, all over the country. So we have, uh, you know, events, um, basically in every region of the country, there's prizes, a swag bag with, you know, head covers and ball markers and things in it that, uh, hats, um, that you get at every event. It's, it's competitive. There's a, you know, there's a skins game. There's, um, a chance to win a, a trip national championship, uh, win a, uh, a trip to Pebble beach for the, the winners of the national championship. Um, got a bunch of awesome sponsors with it. And again, the idea was just to get people together, um, outside of the Facebook forums or discord or, you know, Instagram chats, like let's get, let's get these guys together in one place and, and have them a chance to talk about swag and, and talk about the brand. Um, so that's swag. That's the swag series. And, um, as far as, you know, the wedges go, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, we tried it. Um, it's a lot harder than making a putter, (laughs) uh, probably because I just don't know wedges as well as I know putters, but, um, you know, just learning the grinds, learning how to machine the grinds, learning how to do, um, you know, things that, uh, to a, a different club than I'm used to. Uh, I, ca- I consider myself a putter connoisseur, but uh, I am not a wedge connoisseur by any means. So it was a huge learning curve and it took us a lot longer than I expected. So we have our first set out with the first set of grinds, but we uh, fully intend on expanding on that in the next couple of years. Well, Nick, congrats on the success. I mean, you've got such a good thing going with swag. You clearly live and breathe the product and the category. So uh, I was fascinated by the conversation and I'm sure our listeners will be too. So best of luck. Congrats with everything. And uh, hope to hear more from you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much.
Yeah, Nick, thanks a ton. And they can, uh, listeners can find you, is it swaggolf.com or just what's the website? Swaggolf.com or swag.golf, either one. Okay, awesome. Well, um, thanks everyone. Episode 36, Course Record Show. Please subscribe, um, send it to a friend if you enjoyed the conversation and, um, you know, get you a neon skull, sunglass wearing skull head cover and support Nick Benson. Thanks again, Nick. Appreciate it, guys. 